Welcome back to Break the Silence, Break the Behavior. I'm Erica Taylor, and this is a necessary panel discussion about the socioeconomic changes and effects um, of uterine fibroids, fibroid awareness, with prominent leaders such as today's guest, State Representative Kyra Harris Bolden. State Representative Bolden is serving her second term representing Michigan's 35th House District, which includes the communities of Southfield, Lathrop Village, Beverly Hills, Bingham Farms, and Franklin. Bolden also serves as assistant leader for the House Democrats, and she's a graduate of Southfield Public Schools. She received her bachelor's degree from Grand Valley State University, and then went on to attend the University of Detroit Mercy School of Law. After receiving her Juris Doctorate, uh, Representative Bolden became a civil litigation attorney. She's also a very active member of her community, serving as a member of National Congress of Black Women, Oakland County, the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and as a commissioner of the Total Living Commission for the City of Southfield. She's a member of the Committee on Insurance, the Committee on Judiciary, and serves as the Minority Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. Welcome State Representative Bolden to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent, excellent. State Representative Bolden, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Jan Ketz Nelson, who is a, an entrepreneur and he's a very highly skilled cardiac surgeon and business owner. He's the founder of USA Clinics Groups, which includes the Fibroid Fighters Foundation and USA Fibroid Centers. Dr. Jan has established himself as a very strong advocate for accessibility, affordability, and compassion in the delivery of healthcare services. And um, he also has a center, I believe, in your district. So we're happy about that as well. So we have a presence right there where you are and where your people are. <laughs> So, Representative, we're talking to you today because you are making monumental and historical strides in Michigan. So not only do we want to start off with a thank you for what you've done, but also to talk to you more about the path that led you to that. Um, and so just to let our audience know that on October 6, 2021, uh, Representative Bolden introduced um, legislation to make October uh, Uterine Fibroid Awareness Month in the state of Michigan. So in that that legislation was also adopted, adopted that same day. So thank you so much for that, Representative Bolden. So I'd like to start off the conversation um, with talking about your why, because important, it's important that we know why these legislations are passed and why they're necessary. So let's talk about why you decided to make this a focal point for legislation. Absolutely. So I made this a focal point for legislation, conversation, and actually appropriation as well for research um, because of my own personal experience. And so it was, um, gosh, I, I think it was maybe April of 2020. We were at the height of the pandemic and um, I was not planning so let me just preface this by saying I'm a very open person. And so <laughs> we that we have that in common. All of this I have shared on the Michigan House floor. Uh, so this is nothing to me. So I hope your audience, uh, you know, with the, this conversation appreciates me just being um, open. Um, in April of 2020, um, you know, so I had the pandemic, very, very hard to get into your doctor, uh, much less for an annual checkup. Um, and being in my 30s, I didn't think anything of it, um, but I had not gone to get an annual pap smear the previous year um, because I had experienced a miscarriage. And so I had been to the doctor multiple times and I just kind of skipped my pap smear in 2019. So in April of 2020, or maybe even a little bit before, um, I felt a protrusion in my abdomen and it got so large um, that it to me felt almost like a softball and I could see it when I was looking at myself in the mirror. And um, it, so it, obviously that is something that is alarming and I hoped it wasn't uh, cancer. And so I did my own Google search and found out it was likely to be fibroids. And so I made an appointment uh, with my OB um, who was not available, readily available because it was during the pandemic. So I think I couldn't get an appointment for three months. 
And so in the meantime, I went to my local Planned Parenthood uh, because obviously this is something that is very disturbing. And so I wanted to make sure that I got it checked out. So um, I went to Planned Parenthood and um, they gave me my annual screening and they said there's definitely a protrusion here. We're going to send you to our um, um, to go get uh, an ultrasound. And so at that point, again, this is around April 2020, um, they said you have two fibroids and one is four centimeters and one is three centimeters. And I was thinking, great, um, because, um, you know, in doing my online research, I uh, found out that when they're smaller, you can have a less invasive surgery, um, a laparoscopic uh, surgery. And so I kept my appointment with my um, OB and um, they did a more invasive ultravaginal ultrasound. And we discovered that there were multiple fibroids. And at that time, the biggest one was actually eight centimeters. And, um, and so it, that <laughs> kind of shook me a little bit. Um, and so one thing I learned from that was the importance of one, going to see your doctor, but two, um, having multiple tests done because um, had I just thought that they were very small, I probably wouldn't have went further with testing. I might have just thought, hey, it's, you know, it's fine. It's, it's not going to hurt me. By the time um, I had my myomectomy in December of 2020, um, the largest one had grown to be 10 centimeters and I had seven uh, fibroids removed uh, when I had my myomectomy. And so this is very personal for me because they grew very quickly. Um, they, they were growing at a rate that was, again, in, in July when I went to my OB, it was eight centimeters around about, I, it's, it's kind of hard for them to tell, but by the time it was removed, the biggest one was 10 centimeters. So you can kind of see how quickly, rapidly they were growing. And I just thought about how many women are, or people are going through this, um, experience. Um, I had to take off work for a myomectomy. It's like a C-section. So I had to take time off of work um, and being an elected official. Um, it's, it's, it's not hard to take off work. I definitely have more privilege than other people. Um, but you, for me, I have to tell my constituents why I'm not representing them. You know, I have 90,000 constituents that expect representation. Um, and so I just thought about the millions of people um, that have this challenge that have to take off work, that um, their fertility um, reproductive system is affected um, either by having a surgery, um, by, the, by the fibroids themselves, by scar tissue. I mean, there are so many issues. And through my research, I found out it's the number one cause, is, cause of hysterectomy. Um, in women. And on top of that, it affects black women more severely um, than, than other races. And so I'm learning all of this through my own experience. And then once I put my experience out there, basically on social media to let my uh, constituents know why I wouldn't be at work, I started getting all these messages about people going through something similar and um, people that had way more severe cases than I did. And I just felt the need to bring a voice to this very important issue because it affects so many people. People are suffering in silence um, because talking about your reproductive system to people and, and your potential fertility and things like that is not something that people want to talk about, um, mm -hmm. honestly. And so when I gave my story on the House floor um, the first time, because I, I think that I, I've talked about I think I've talked about my reproductive system more than anybody else on the House floor, at least since I've been serving. Um, but, you know, you can hear audible um, uncomfortableness uh, when I'm giving my speech. And, you know, again, this is something that people deal with. And this is something that many of my constituents deal with. And I just wanted to bring a voice to it. So ever since then, um, I've been trying to raise awareness um, for the people suffering in silence. Um, the, the governor, Gretchen Whitmer, put $500,000 in um, her proposed budget 
in order to have research for fibroids per our office's request. And so we're hoping it makes it into the full budget and we're actually looking to increase that amount as well. And then we've also developed uh, prevention legislation as well. So thank you for letting me uh, take a long time <laughs> to <laughs> share why this is incredibly, incredibly important to me and why that we need to uh, raise this, this issue. Um, in Michigan, but nationally as well, because as well, it affects millions of people. Absolutely. I mean, we've got quite a bit to unpack here because you've, you've not only told us um, your personal story, which thank you so much for sharing that. For a lot of women, that's something that's, that doesn't come as easy as it does to, say, you and I, of, of opening up and talking about something intimate yet so impactful to your life. Um, so I want to kind of go back to when you were diagnosed. Um, you said you had the myomectomy in December of 2020, were you given any other treatment option at that time? So um, I was, and um, I want to commend uh, my OBGYN, uh, Dr. Lalanya Moore. Um, she, we went through everything. She even worked with my schedule for my myomectomy so I could miss the least amount of work possible. And I know that that sounds insane to some people, but I am a workaholic and I, again, I represent 90,000 people and I really, uh, it's important to me to be at work. And so um, she really worked with me to make sure that um, I missed the least amount of work possible. Um, but when they did the intravaginal ultrasound and found out I had so many multiples, and again, the, the biggest one that they knew at that time was eight centimeters and they knew the rate of growth. Um, she said, you know, we can treat the symptoms. We can treat uh, the pain that you're experiencing, uh, you know, heavy, heavy. It was mostly heavy bleeding and um, um, frequency in urination. Fortunately, I didn't have any other uh, terrible symptoms. Um, but again, what led me to go is I could actually see it protruding from my body. Um, she recommended to me mainly because I was looking to um, have children in the next couple of years um, that having children or getting pregnant with that many fibroids and with that size uh, would be um, potentially uh, dangerous um, because it, they tend to grow with pregnancy. And so it was recommended to me for that reason that I have a, have a myomectomy just to make sure that everything was good before trying to have start to have children again. And that was the main reason. So I was given options and I felt like that was the best option for me because of where I was in my reproductive journey. Kyra, what? Sorry. Like, let the I, doctor knew, I knew you were waiting to speak. Let the <laughs> Thank you very much for having me and Kyra. Because of people like you, I believe will move the mountains and help everyone. One uterus at a time. OK, so Kyra, what options were you given? I understood that you had the different options, Monday versus Friday versus morning versus weekend. But what other except my maximum options were give, you were, give, were you given? Now that's a great question. And so it was mostly symptom managing, so I can't tell you what the um so either myomectomy or symptom management or conservative treatment were you ever given option of uterine fiber embolization ufp not that i'm aware of okay you're a congresswoman you're very famous and you're very public about this and i'm feel that i'm sorry in saying that you were not offered the best fertility friendly minimum base of option. Let me tell you what's going on with fiber thing, just to give you a perspective of someone who is not personally suffering from this, but has a knowledge of magic miracle that can change the world of fibroids. You think you were just symptomatic and pain and bleeding. You actually suffered miscarriage. Most probably this miscarriage, the fibroids kill the baby. Miscarriage was caused by fibroids because it's number one reason. Fibroids number one reason of fibroids. So nothing benign and very kind. We should not be too kind to fibroids. Second thing, there was for 25 years or more, there was a FDA approved treatment called fibroid and uterine fibroid embolization. 
And um, it's a treatment went through the tiny needle hole, either here in the radial artery or wrist or groin. We insert one millimeter catheter that goes all the way in the artery towards the origin of the blood vessels that feed those fibroids. We clog them, fibroids die, get absorbed by the body. Whole procedure takes 20, 30, 40 minutes. Hour, two hours later, you can go home, you can be at work in two, three days. And as far as I understood, you were not given this option. Do you know why? I do not. I do not purport to be a, a, a doctor. Um, I have actually in my research um, and, you know, not to say it's extensive. Again, I have not gone to school for this. I am admittedly a lawyer and know nothing about uh, the medical sciences, um, but I've actually never heard of that. <laughs> so wow. that's, yeah. that's interesting. When next time you, you go and see your gynecologist, please ask her. Doctor, why do you know about your fee? What was the reason you did not recommend? Because I know the reason. When you go to Walmart, nobody sends you to Target. So this procedure was around for a very, very long time. And I can tell you another thing. Fibroids don't make hysterectomies. Gynecologists do. Fibroids is a disease that has multiple treatment. Suffering is terrible. Suffering is terrible. Nobody should suffer, and it's because it causes a pain and bleeding and anemia and weakness and huge physical, mental, socioeconomic and other things. And I'm sure Erica would like us to talk more about this because that's what we do. We have more than 100 locations, mostly in inner cities, um, like 36 locations in New York City alone, Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn. And so the point is people suffer and for no particular reason and they don't know about option that was available for 25 years. And I think the whole point of fighting fibroids is how to make sure that, I don't know, 50, 60 percentile of uh, percentage of uh, black women and maybe 30, 40% of white women that actually unlikely to have this problem instead of surgeries can have as early as possible this UOV procedure, like straighten the teeth that will let them an ability to have absolutely best version of their life and have a health equity and not depend on the bad luck. So that's what we think, you know, is possible with really Kyra would like you to, uh, you know, check online fibroidfighters.org or usafibroidcenters.com and just look more for your fee to start deeply understand that Government can do better job protect the the people, much better job. For example, your fees covered by your fees covered by Medicare uh, by Medicaid and and uh, all private insurances. Um, it's a it's very appropriate for the government for state uh, 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 healthcare department. It, it just issued the guidelines. They said before doing castration hysterectomy, right? Removing a reproductive organ is equal castration. In a woman of reproductive age or any age, please consider other minimal invasive options. That doesn't work like this today. Today, gynecologists, because they they basically surgeon for certain area of the body, like urologists are surgeons for other area, you know, area of the body. They just do what they think they do, what they always done. They did surgeries. Now the other specialties like interventional uh, radiologists, they don't do surgery. They do those minimal invasive procedures and nobody knows about them because they don't have access to patients. Patients don't know about them. And I think if we'll be able to just bring awareness, like you Kyra just learned about this, if we'll, you know, obviously after um, mini education and understanding what's going on, if we'll be able to bring this awareness to every woman, when they start suffering from fibroids, just, oh my God, it's not a big deal. It's 30, 40 minute procedure, hour procedure. I can be home 
in the office. I can be home hour, two hours later, go home, go to work in two days. Why would I suffer? Why would I risk my miscarriages? Why would I risk to be embarrassed to spotting blood? Or why would I take, be constipated from iron pills? Why would I do blood transfusion and get hepatitis risk? Why would I, 30% of women with fibroids don't have a sex life. Why would I limit myself and my partner? Why would I have a miscarriages? And why, God's sake, I would agree on any surgery, especially hysterectomy. Hysterectomy is called Mississippi appendectomy. And the meaning of this wording is double diminishing. Appendectomy is portion of the body that is needed. So when we remove it, oh, not a big deal. And that means that doing hysterectomy is not a big deal, although it's a huge deal. And in Mississippi, I guess it's so common that everybody gets it. So, Kyra, I'm sorry, you know, there was a, a lot of medical terms. Uh, no, but, no. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Dave, I, I think you're in a position to, you're a megaphone, and you're very open and comfortable talking about this. If not you, Kyra, who, who can make a difference? Right. Dr. Yan, your screen has frozen. Um, so we're gonna, we're hopefully it'll come back to us, but um, you are frozen for this for a second. We can hear you, but your screen is frozen. Um, okay. so well, well I'll, I'll pose another question and we'll see if it comes back. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, okay. Is that better? Uh, not quite. You came back on, but you're frozen again. So we may try that again in just a second, hopefully. Um, we can definitely hear you, but um, we can't see you for the moment. So, um, okay. but I'll, I'll, we'll continue the conversation for now. Um, so Representative Bolden, how does that make you feel, uh, you know, knowing, uh, basically finding something out now that you didn't know before? And, and let me also just, you know, empathize with you because I too had two myomectomies and did not know about UFE. So um, therein lies my reason for um, pushing this platform as well is, is, you know, helping to educate women about the possibilities. And thank you, Dr. Yan, you are back with us. Thank you. Um, so how do you feel after hearing what Dr. Yan is, has expressed? Oh, I'm, if there are other treatments available um, that can be uplifted, um, I mean, that, that is wonderful because again, I know so many people suffering um, from this condition and you know i think it's all about awareness and and making sure that people know because like i said even through you know my my google search of you know with fibroids i saw laparoscopic i saw myomectomy i saw you know these different treatments so um that's not a treatment that i had even seen through you know just a, a online forum so um i would love to know uh more information um about it and you know so other people can be aware that maybe this is something they should ask their doctors about um going forward yeah absolutely and i think you mentioned um when you were talking about gretchen whitmer uh and the donation that she made toward um the budget um you mentioned something about prevention legislation for the future and something that you all hope to to bring forth um can you give us a little more insight into what that looks like and then also in relation to what dr yan has introduced is making sure that that information is provided to people uh in the state and then hopefully you know we'll, we'll expand that out to a national level yeah so legislation that we've been working on is just making sure that people have uh access to um to ultrasounds um, in, in, in our communities. I think that's the first step is knowing that you have fibroids and where they are and how they're affecting you. Um, because I think far too often we don't know that we have fibroids until they become a problem. Um, at least that was the case for me. <laughs> um, and so we're working on legislation to make sure that ultrasounds are included with your annual um, exams and that there's information available from your doctors about all of their op your options for fibroids um, as well as making sure that uh, these less invasive procedures are available um, and covered through insurances. 
So that's kind of the legislation that, that we've been working on. I'm really focused on preventative uh, care or at least knowing where you are because not every case is severe and, and we, we know that. But again, by the time that people realize they have fibroids specifically, it's already been a, it's already a problem. Um, one of the biggest problems, um, like the doctor indicated, is just education because, you know, um, doctors will say uh, if you have an irregular or a heavy menstruation, that could be a symptom of fibroids. Well, one does the average woman know their menstruation in comparison to other, another woman? Exactly. No. <laughs> so most of the time you don't know that you're heavy um, and that's, that's a symptom. And if you are heavy, you know, a lot of times women are just told that, you know, well, you, there are some things that you may have to do. You may have to use, you know, change your tampon more frequently or do just do some other things. I don't think it's readily connected to you may have actually a condition that you may need to address. And so there is a lot of education that needs to be done done amongst our community members, but I think amongst doctors as well. Um, and just making sure that they have the tools available to educate their patients about um, and having more robust conversations, particularly with women about uh, about menstruation and any potential symptoms um, that they may have, any irregularities that they may be experiencing, um, because all that's not necessarily captured in an annual pap smear. Absolutely. And as you talk about the, the type of legislation that you're discussing and, and the future plans that you have, one of the um, things that Dr. Yan consistently speaks about is early education um, and making sure that our young girls know what it looks like when something goes wrong versus you know what things are supposed to look like. Um, and as we all know that we spend a lot of time educating on just you know just the general health issues of you know talking about STIs and talking about pregnancy early too early and all those things. But we don't really talk about you know what happens when your your cycle is irregular or if the pain is too great and what that looks like. So is early education something that you all plan on discussing in the future as well? Uh, yes, we hope so. We're, we're trying to figure out what that component looks like. We're trying to work with doctors. Again, I am not a medical professional. And so I, um, I am a proponent of people in that space, you know, know the, the most, but we have a broken system here. And so I've been working with the doctors in my area to see what works and what makes sense um, from, from their medical perspective and how we can codify that into legislation. It's not been an easy conversation. Um, and I understand there is apprehension to having basically legal mandates regarding health care. Um, but there is, this is broken. <laughs> and so Ira, I'm yeah. your doctor. I'm yeah. licensed in Michigan as many 20 plus states. And they, we have an office in Southfield and we're adding interventional radiologists. And I think what uh, is, um, you know, very interesting that, thank you, Erica, for a very specific question. The ultrasound, including ultrasounds in the annual exam, which translating to what I understand this, they never precluded, but because it's annual exam, it will be covered, no copays, no other thing. It will be easy access to ultrasound. I think it will be amazing because you were, anxious for a few months to figure out what's wrong with me instead of people knowing oh i have a small fiber does it give me troubles doesn't give me trouble what are the troubles or oh, bad menstrual period losing a lot of blood pain during intercourse you know other things or oh, when it starts i will not be you know women will think i will not be stressed because i know i have a fertility friendly minimal invasive procedure by the way it's very important to know that Uterine fiber embolization improves chances of pregnancies and, and delivery of normal babies because, uh, you know, there's no more competition and it doesn't cut, you know, through the uterus. And uh, we had, after the first 5,000 uh, UFEs that we've done in our locations, we have seen about 1% need for repeated procedure versus myomectomy, uh, that will be small quiz, Kyra, 
what do you think the risk of returning fibroids after myomectomy? Well, I can tell you that it's very high because I have two currently <laughs> and they have started did, to Did the doctor back. tell you that it's about 50% after about three years? I didn't know it was 50%, but that sounds about right. <laughs> but you, you say how terrible it is. I mean, you know, it's like farming. They grow, then they harvest a few times, then hysterectomy. You know what happens after hysterectomy? Everything falls down and there's your gynecologist now, your good friends that do suspension, blood suspension, other suspension to make sure there's no leakage. So the system is broken and differently. Definitely, I would like to know who are the doctors that participating in uh, in crafting this uh, early education and approach. Are they just gynecologists or general practitioners? Who are the folks that helping you? So we've talked to a lot of different organizations. Um, so one of the uh, organizations we've had to talk to are uh, the insurance companies, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, that that's a conversation. Um, but then also uh, the gyneco uh, gynecological association, um, the Michigan State, um, I forget the actual organization's name, but um, Doctors Association um, as well. And, and there's been a few other um, associations for different physicians that we have consulted with um, regarding the language. So we crafted the language, we sent it out to them. We haven't introduced it yet because we believe in feedback and we know it's not gonna go anywhere anyway if folks don't have buy-in, right? And again, I don't purport to be a medical professional, so I don't want to introduce things that don't make sense. Um, but we've talked to at least uh, four physician organizations as well as insurance companies. So I would appreciate if you share with me, you know, the, the language. Now, Absolutely. the uterine fiber embolization is done by interventional radiology. This is a few societies, but major is Society of Interventional Radiology that were promoting this for more than 25 years and nobody listens. So I definitely think that needs to be introduced. Now, maybe I'm right or wrong. I don't know what was the conversation with the insurances, but let me give you a little color on what I think the insurance conversation can be very helpful. The cost of care, just care for women with fibroids can be in two, three hundred thousand dollar range. It's uh, going to the doctor, it's taking the medications, it's sometimes getting addicted to medication. It's urgent care, it's MRIs, hospitalization, it's pain, it's uh, infertility treatments, and myomectomy, sometimes two or three, sometimes with ICU stay, like we know some people here, and, uh, and hysterectomy, and after that, more surgeries. 9% of women after hysterectomy become a drug addicts because of such severe pain after hysterectomy. So, Two, three hundred thousand dollars, maybe even more. Not counting written writing off the best 20, 30 years of the life, not having babies that lost with miscarriages, and future generation not possible. I know some doctors have an average age of women for hysterectomy 27. 27. Medicaid data. I have access to Medicaid data. And uh, so it's it's a it's a like mass castration. And uh, on another side, if you do, I don't know, $10,000 treatment that uh, interventional radiologists do for uh, for this UFE, suddenly you have 20 to 30 return on investment, you know, ROI just for medical spend, not counting normal life. How do you count normal life? Pharmaceutical companies count $180,000 a year, cost of normal life, quality normal life. That's how they price extraordinary costly medications. So. It's unbelievable what can be done, but nobody knows because if you go to GYN to talk what's the best for fiber, the GYN treat, you'll only get what's good for GYN. Right. It's like going to tax to drivers. I'm so sorry. People are people and self-interest, self-interest. And I just, I don't know. I, I would rather be as open as it, I can to understand that we need to bring other point of view. Another point of view is a, uh, interventional radiology and uterine fibroid embolization because when people come to us for example in usa fibroid centers they get a call or can schedule online they come within an hour they get doctor's visit transvaginal transabdominal ultrasound they get a diagnosis 
In rare cases, we send for MRI if anything needed, and they schedule in two or three weeks. We schedule treatment, few you know, 30, 40 minute treatment, our home, and that's it. That simple. When and can be 10, 11, 15, 20 women can be done in one location. That means we can just solve everyone's problem. <laughs> and those interventional radiology, the amazing thing. I'll tell you more. It's not just women specific, men too. I mean, prostatectomy or tur prostate treatment, they butcher it too. And they're done all the time for men. And after that, men had the impotence. You know, you don't like talking about uh, menstrual period. Trust me, men doesn't want to talk about <laughs> impotence on direct ejaculation that they cannot be fertile and other things. But interventional radiologists do prostate artery embolization to shrink prostate. Nobody knows about this. That's called progress. Mm -hmm. First, to change natural history of the disease, surgery was invented. Then minimal invasive surgery. But now many things can be done if we're not lucky enough with the pills, with a percutaneous, transcutaneous, catheter-based approach. And there's a sense of less relevance for all the regional specialties. Trust me, I'm a heart surgeon. I love doing heart surgery. But then cardiology is treated more and more and more. And it's what we call a progress. And other specialties that they need to embrace and think, how can we help more women? How can we educate every woman? And gynecologists need to, I think, instead of counting myomectomy, hysterectomy, they need to think how many women we gave 20, 30 years of the best lives. And because they're so close to women and can watch and help them, I think that needs to be the pivot. Obviously, you know, I'm not GYN, I, but they, I'll be as loud as I can. And myself, through Fibroid Fighters, through the amazing job we do. And Kyra, hopefully you'll be on our side and we'll be happy to review this language and come. We'll be happy in Southfield open the location that exactly does this, that we can help all the women and would definitely like to celebrate this awareness in October in your district. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Jan. I, I, I'm sure that you've been a wealth of information for Representative Bolden today. Um, and, and with that said, I like to think about this on a national level. We've had discussions regarding the Stephanie Tubjones Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act of 2021. And um, with you putting in this legislation in place in Michigan, do you see a way for you all to work cohesively together to push that national bill forward? Oh, absolutely. You know, the things that we are doing, uh, we're definitely reaching out to national partners. Um, the, uh, you know, We Can Wear White campaign has been um, heavily involved. We've had meetings with them. And we're just trying to make sure that the language makes sense um, for us because we don't like to introduce things that go nowhere. <laughs> um, and so we're just trying to make sure that it makes sense. Um, but in the meantime, I think um, appropriations to um, research and, um, and to um, prevention and to education um, will be greatly um, helpful while we are um, crafting this legislation. And absolutely, once we get it in a good place, we'll share it uh, nationally and hopefully we can bring more awareness uh, nationally for this issue. Absolutely. Awareness and funding and research is what the wish list is, definitely. Um, and just to ask you this, I'm not sure. I know it's the month of May and you've just declared October um, as Fibroid Awareness Month in Michigan, but can you give us a glimpse of what your maybe your wish list looks like for October in Michigan for women who uh, are suffering from fibroids or have just recently been diagnosed? What does it look like in Michigan? Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. And we're trying to figure out in my office if we're going to introduce fibroids again or do a combination of I also did a pregnancy loss awareness month. Um, I think that was in 2020. Um, and because the two are so interconnected, we're trying to figure out if it makes sense to do um, both or should we do them separately? But um, I think, you know, for us, it's continuing to do programs like this. Um, and to just raise awareness of of just 
fibroids and that, you know, when you have symptoms, this could be a condition that you may have. I think, again, that's the first step because otherwise I would have never known unless I would have, I mean, it's quite possible that I could have seen the protrusion and just been like, oh, you know, um, this is strange, but it really wasn't for me affecting my life in such a way that I would have done anything differently strictly because of the symptoms. Um, but what was going on internally, um, yeah, would have affected my ability to have a child. And so it's, I mean, it's, it's really important. So even if you're not experiencing, um, you know, extreme symptoms, it's important that you know where you are in managing your, um, your fibroids. Absolutely. And as you all continue your education planning, um, throughout the year, I would really strongly encourage you to involve Dr. Yan in his research. Um, it's something that should be more widely well known and is not as he stated. Um, you know, I have very personal uh, experience with everything that you've discussed and including intensive care unit from a myomectomy um, and rehospitalization from my second one. So having that information, I think, was really key and critical. So, you know, I'm going to volunteer him for you uh, to be uh, an access for information on uterine fibroid embolization, because when women are diagnosed first off, um, we don't know, you know, once we get beyond the idea that we might have cancer um, and realize that these are non-cancerous tumors, then we're talking about the treatment options and we're so open and vulnerable at that time of diagnosis, it's truly important that we know exactly what our, all of our options are. So, um, you know, as a lot of, you know, OBGYNs do not uh, actively offer um, uh, UFE because it is a practice from an interventional cardiologist, um, interventional radiologist, excuse me, um, then it's something that we need to make women aware of themselves, the patients themselves aware that this option is available. So um, I definitely encourage, you know, you and your, uh, your, your staff to look into that possibility. Um, so I, I want to, you know, basically close this out and, you know, thank both of you all for this conversation. And then just my last point on this is the importance of this information being in the community. Um, Dr. Yan's locations are in the community. Um, as he mentioned early on in the conversation, he's in the Bronx, he's, you know, you know, Brooklyn, you know, so Dr. Yan, how important is it that your centers are located where the patients are, where the women are who are suffering the most and, and have accessibility? That's incredibly important. Listen, we, we're here to make a difference. And uh, knowing that uh, black women suffer more than whites, you know, by far, in the, um, in the prevalence of the disease, in the early start, in the heaviness of the symptoms, more than twice and a half uh, compli the risk of complications, and the lack of awareness, I think that's what we need to do. We need to make it easy. Listen, if in 21st century, we have, you know, phones, we, we like easy, we like possible, life are complicated. We need to make it very easy for people. That means it needs to be effective. It must work. So uterine fibroid embolization works, you know, 99.9% we don't need repeated procedure. And we have the largest worldwide experience in our, look, in our USA fibroid centers. It needs to be covered by insurance. It is covered by insurance. Now it needs to be accessible. That means People need to walk in and get the treatment. They should not wait for three, six months. We shouldn't say, oh, we do the best job, and I believe we do the best job, you know, but uh, we need to put this to work. So we work sometimes seven days a week, extended hours, walk in and welcome. So we build not about us, we build around the patient. Like sometimes I ask everyone, please close your eyes and think, I'm the patient, I'm this woman, I'm this man, you know. That's my situation. How would I like to be treated? What will help me with my other obligation towards work, family and other things to make it possible? So I think that's the miracle of this, that minimal days of treatments. And now I'm talking beyond just UFE and, and GYN and, and, and the fibroid situation. Minimal days of treatment, that's the future of medicine. And I think our focus needs to be on cure not care and I, I want you kind of to think about it's like we can care for disease for 20 30 years and it provide an, an enormous benefits for the hospitals doctors everybody else like just 
really. That's what it is. You know, the more we do, that's fee for service model. Instead of it, we can cure the disease very early. And beneficiary will be patient. And I want doctors to embrace this more, like us, embrace more. How do we take care of cure problems early? So people will not suffer, that money will not be wasted, that life will not be wasted. And uh, I, I think it just interesting thing, Kyra, about this ultrasound that you've done, you know, your request. That was another thought in, in another state. If someone does ultrasound, how can we have access to this information? And every patient, I, I think it was Senator Gibson in Florida, has that information about every woman with fiber in ultrasound can be tracked. So people will have a score, like a heart surgery. New York State uh, was um, recording the mortality and every surgeon was had a you know public listing of what's the outcomes of his or her heart surgery. So Senator Gibson suggests, and that was passed, that Every person, when they have information about the fibroids, it's tracked. It's depository database in the system. Yeah, she said database, and they're building the database. That means it will be actionable. It will not be hidden. If someone does ultrasound and it just goes in seal of the EMR and this doctor, nobody knows. But if this ultrasound with the recording, with the diagram, objective images, is someone in the database, we can score. Oh, we had the, wow, you know, out of 90,000 patients, you have 15,000 fibroids and 10,000 had a hysterectomy and nobody had your fee. Or out of 15,000, nobody had any treatment. Patient was suffering, going to hospitalization. I think that will give a, a, a ocean of information that will be undeniable. Because right now, because ultrasound will objectivize the disease. And when you have ultrasound, obviously the symptoms and labs and anemia, everything will be recording, absenteeism, you know, marriage uh, situation, uh, fertility history. Then I think state of Michigan will have hopefully the biggest documentation of this disaster, right, pandemic in, in the whole world. And, and I would really like to help, if possible, Kyra, and volunteer and see how we can guide this effort. What you do is amazing. And, uh, you know, like they're saying, no good, like let's not get a good disaster kind of to go without benefit. So whatever they, so you had your personal problem, but you turn this to enormous benefit for millions. And uh, I just want to be by your side. That's wonderful, Dr. Young. And it, yes, and Representative Bolden, thank you for making our business everyone's business. It's very important. Um, if you have any closing thoughts, Representative, please feel free to share them right now. Well, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, giving me a platform to share my story. Um, I think it's an important one. Um, and I do realize that many women um, have suffered way more than me. I think my case has been mild, but um, just to give a glimmer of hope, I am pregnant. I'm six months. And so Congratulations. Um, thank you. Thank you. And so it's been a journey, um, but just want to give uh, folks out there a, a glimmer of hope um, to just keep going, but really be um, adamant about your health and be an advocate for yourself. Um, until we can put some things in place to uh, be more helpful. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank oh, you both for a very on a high note. <laughs> Absolutely. Congratulations to you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you both. Please continue to enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for joining us on Break the Silence, Break the Behavior. It's been a very riveting conversation and my honor. Thank you. Thank you.